Okay, so it's not the most exciting lab to do in the world, but you know it has one of the most important and impressive types of calculations to be able to do. Now here's the thing about the ice cube lab that's pretty much standard lab that uh, we do everywhere as chemistry teachers. You put the ice cube into water and you're thinking to yourself, it's a pretty straightforward kind of a thing. We have an ice cube undergoing a phase change, that's NH, and we have the water undergoing a temperature change, that's MC delta T. So there's the formula, and let's say the question was to calculate the molar heat of melting of ice. Well, that would be isolate the, the term big H and, and be able to solve the question. But there's actually a problem with that. There's something else here in this system that has to be taken into account in the calculation. Well, what is it? Now, I'm going to give you a hint. There is something else other than the ice that's gaining heat here. Something else other than the ice that's gaining heat. Now, here's what most students always say. They say, oh, it's the, it's the air, it's the, it's the cup, uh, it's the thermometer, it's the, it's the retort stand that it's sitting on. Now, think about it, though. If everything here starts off at room temperature and the ice is put into the water, then the water's getting colder. Then the water is getting, since the water is getting colder, it's absorbing heat now from the cup, from the retort stand, from the air, from the thermometer. See, this is what it is. It's the water coming off the ice. You understand that, that as the ice is melting, it's turning into liquid water. The liquid water itself is gaining heat in this investigation. So it's not just the ice cube that's gaining heat, it's the water coming off the ice. It's undergoing a temperature change, and you have to include that into the formula. So here's what it looks like. So to tackle this calculation, heat loss equals heat gain, there's water and there's ice. But remember, there's also that water that's coming off the ice that we have to take into account. It's undergoing a temperature change. So there's another heat gain here, and it's the ice water, or the water coming off the ice, which is called the ice water. So the temperature change of the calorimeter water is going to be MC delta T. The change in the ice is NH because it's undergoing a phase change, but the water coming off the ice is undergoing a temperature change, both on the heat gain side. They're both gaining heat from the calorimeter water. Okay, so now we plug the numbers in, and this is what we get. Well, first of all, <laughs> we've got to re rearrange the formula and then plug it in. You know, that's very important. Rearrange the formula first, and then you go for plugging in all the numbers. So if you want to isolate big H, we have to subtract ice water from each side. So we get the MC delta T of the calorimeter water minus the MC delta T of the ice water, and that's all divided by N, which is the number of moles of the ice, and that'll get you the molar heat of melting of the ice. Okay, so when we plug the numbers in, now look what I did. I just kept it in grams and joules, so our answer is going to be, remember it's a molar heat we're looking for, big H. So it's going to be per mole, joules per mole in this case. So 100 grams of calorimeter water times 4.19, which is the specific heat capacity of water. There's a temperature change of 5 degrees written out properly. Then the mass of the ice water is the mass of the ice. It's 15 grams times 4.19. Hey, I thought it was ice. No, it's ice, water, 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 liquid, liquid. So it's 4.19. That's the liquid, right? That's, that's melted off of the ice. And the temperature change is from the final temperature. Oh, the final temperature isn't 25, is it? It's 20. Because this goes from 25 down to 20, so this goes up from 0 to 20, which is the final temperature. So when you do this calculation, here getting joules, here getting joules, subtracting from each other, and then dividing by the moles of the ice, which is 15 grams divided by the molar mass, see everything gets plugged in, you're able to then come up with an answer of, for big H, 
5.95 times 10 to the 3 joules per mole. Then, on any exam, you could write OR, and everybody understands that 10 to the 3 is kilo, and you can write 5.95 kilojoules per mole. That's how much heat has to be absorbed for this ice per mole. Now, you know what? That's not really the data book value or, or any kind of, of actual value we know for the mole heat of melting of ice, which is supposed to be 6.01 kilojoules per mole. Here we've got an answer of 5.95. So there must be uh, an experimental error here. And we can calculate the percent error. And the percent error formula is you take your theoretical value and you subtract from it the experimental value that you get in any experiment and then divide that by the theoretical value again and then times 100. But look, it's absolute value of theoretical minus experimental. So any negative that you get in here, if you flip these two around, it doesn't matter. You just take the difference between the two because any negative makes this, well, the you know, absolute value brackets make it a positive. And, and that's important because, you know, really negative percent errors aren't very good. You just have a percent error whether you're uh, above or below your actual value, just what is that percent? You don't have to have a negative. Just don't do that. So the percent error in this case is 6.01, which is the theoretical value. It's in, the, it's in any kind of booklet that, that has data in it. Minus 5.95 that we just got in the last question, in kilojoules per mole, divide by 6.01 times 100. Do that math first and divide by that times 100, you get yourself 1.00% error. So that's a pretty good percent error. Well, of course, you know, I did make up the question.